Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first semi-final of FameLab International 2014. Now please put your hands together and greet your host for the evening, Quentin Cooper. Good evening. Thank you, disembodied voice of God. Yes, I am Quentin Cooper, tweeting for historical reasons as at Material World. And welcome if you are here with us or if you're watching on our via the internet, the special dedicated FameLab YouTube channel to this back cover event. I like the fact that we're a back cover event for the Cheltenham International Science Festival. And this is the first of two epic international smackdowns that will ultimately decide who is crowned, or whatever the equivalent of crowned in non-monarchical countries, brackets now including Spain, are the FameLab International Champion 2014. And when I say epic, I do mean epic. This is getting ridiculous. 25 countries represented this year. Can you stop being so bloody successful, FameLab? 25, current like this, we won't just have semi-finals, we'll have to have quarter-finals and playoff groups as well. Do you know, it was over 50 years before the World Cup managed to get up to 24. Fame Lab has been only going seven years internationally, and we've reached 25. So we are bigger than the World Cup. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyone here who has very little idea of what Fame Lab is and what you're in for over the next three, four, or five hours? No, I will try and keep it to two ish. Anybody new? Stick your hand up. You're not going to be picked up. Fine, great, okay, fine. Okay, so here are the bare essentials, or core concepts, since we're in a science festival. Uh, that everyone has earned their place here by winning their national final. They've done so by doing what they will also try to do tonight. Getting across in just three minutes, without the aid of a safety net or PowerPoint, something mind-expanding, heart-warming, or liver-curdling about science. If they should go over three minutes, they will hear this. <laughs> the scariest noise in the world. They'll then also have a couple of minutes, just a couple of minutes exposure to our judges, where, if past fame labs are anything to go by, they'll be subjected to questioning that could be any combination of razor-sharp and random. And the judges will select five people to go through to Thursday night's final. There's a bit more to it than that, but like anything remotely fun, it's best to just get it out of the box and start playing. Uh, now, everyone, I did say everyone you're about to see tonight is a winner. Of course, that's not quite true, because whereas our semi-finalists have won, earned their right to be here, our judges have just volunteered, which is very kind of them. So can we start by meeting our three judges? Please welcome to the Cheltenham stage. Our chair is former tip-top swap shop favourite, tomorrow's world leader, and more recently, bang goes the theorist, Maggie Philbin. And I should say, for the sake of international audiences, those are all much-loved British TV programmes. <laughs> uh, Maggie's also leading the uh, UK Digital Skills Task Force, whose report is due, I think, round about now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah July. Ma July, OK. Uh, now, second judge, Phil Manning, who, as well as being perilously close to an anagram of Maggie Philbin, is head of the paleontology research group at Manchester University, an expert on tracking dinosaurs, uh, presenters of, among other things, National Geographic's Jurassic CSI, next showing tomorrow, Nat Geo Wild, 10.30 p.m., so you could just get there into after the second semi-final. And just a couple of hours ago, he took a Cheltenham audience back millions of years in search of what we really know about the true nature of dinosaurs. Phil Manning. And Phil got a particularly um, uh, detailed introduction there because I made a complete mess of it when I introduced him at the UK one. But anyway, yeah. completing our triumvirate is popular science writer, in both senses of the word, Scientific American blogger Jennifer Ouellette. She's particularly interested in the intersection of physics and popular culture. And you can also tell she's a bit of a Trekkie because she blogs and tweets as Jean-Luc Picant. Jennifer Ouellette. <laughs> So, Maggie, first of all, thank you. Thank you all for agreeing to be our judges tonight. It is no easy task, given that everybody here is already a winner. And also, some of them are speaking in their native tongue, some in their second language, some in their third language. How are you going to choose worthy finalists, given such variable in initial conditions? Well, it's very hard. And I was thinking, actually, that the three-minute rule, that's just about the level 
then sort of a typical tomorrow's world item, <laughs> so I'll, I'll have my eye in. Um, well, the, the first thing is, it's compelling content. We've got to be really engaged, we've got to you know, really listen to it, and it needs to be delivered clearly so that we understand it, you can follow it, we've got one go to understand it. And then it's that special something that someone has that you think, oh no, carry on, we want to hear more. You know, that charisma. There's the C. And you're going to use those two minutes of questions, Phil, to try and just find out that they're not just they're not actors that you know or performers. They're scientists. They know stuff beyond what they've put in those three minutes. It's so important that more scientists engage with the public and have real scientists talking about real science that they're working on is, I think, fantastic. And if you scratch the surface and there's nothing beneath it, you get worried. So we're very interested in probing, not in an alien sort of way, but probing the contestants to try and find out exactly what they know about their topic. Okay, well, we just try and remove the graphic image of <laughs> Phil's alien probe there from, from, our, from our mind. And Jennifer, you're our, you're our transatlantic import for this. Is this, a, <laughs> is this a new weird experience for you? Or? It's very, very different, but I'm looking forward to it. Three minutes is a really short time, so you've got to really like be very, very good and have on-point analogies, and then I'm hoping to get some ideas. <laughs> so. Yeah, basically, just steal things. That's I'm going to steal things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. It is down to them to decide who makes it through to tonight. That, in turn, of course, will be down to what each fame labber does, and also to the amount of noise generated generated by the audience, so you get to influence them. But just to make the judges feel warm and happy, could you give them a round of applause now, please? And I should also say that should any of our semi-finalists need any extra bit of inspiration, I will point out that Maggie Philbin had a top 20 UK single many years ago. I won't say how many, but I think suspect possibly before many of our fame labbers was born. It was with Keith Chegwin and Noel Evans, and it was called Maggie. Yeah. I want to be a winner, the appropriate thing. And I have to say, in doing the research for this, I found the YouTube video, and now the bloody song will not go out of my head. It's terrible. But everybody, of course, isn't just wanting to be a winner tonight. Everybody already is a winner. So A, they've earned their place here. B, whatever happens, you have already won, and we are about to start our victory parade. And our first semi-finalist is also one of our furthest flung, the winner of Fame Lab South Africa, Raven Motsewabangwe. It's almost... Right. It's almost 6,000 miles as Raven's close relative, the crow, flies from where he's based up near the border with Botswana, somewhere now known officially as Mahikeng, more commonly called Mafikeng, and remembered historically, at least in the UK, as Mafikeng, as in the siege of Mafikeng during the Boer Wars. Whatever you call it, Raven's at the university there and only a few months away from completing his BSc honours degree in microbiology, which leaves him precious little time for volleyball, which he loves, and barely enough for Fame Lab, which he's becoming very fond of. Can be a bit nerve-wracking going first, but since Raven Motsiwabangwe is an anagram of went now as mega brave, if he's true to his name, he'll be fine. Please raise the roof for Raven Motsiwabangwe. <laughs> Ever wondered what would happen if Superman caught the flu? Would he sneeze hurricanes? Would he sweat acid? Or would his fever literally cause global warming? Well, either way, it would be one great, not so natural disaster. But fortunately for Superman, he has an awesome superpower. He is immune to disease. The man just cannot fall sick. Well, unless you flash a green rock in his face. But don't you find it strange that we're so amazed at the power superpowers of a fictional superhero, whereas, in fact, humankind has possessed the power of immunity long before the Man of Steel was even a concept on a piece of paper. But then here's this word, immunity. What is immunity? Immunity is basically our body's ability to defend itself against invading pathogens, such as bacteria or viruses. Now, it is also our body's ability to keep itself as sterile as possible. Now, immunity comes in two forms. You have our innate immunity as well as our adaptive immunity. Now, our innate immunity is our God-given ability to defend ourselves against these bacteria. Now, these, um, this defense is carried out by an army of vicious cells called phagocytes. Now, phagocytes, um, oh my goodness. Now, phagocytes defend the body by um, identifying the outer coating of these pathogens, such as the proteins, as well as, for example, their DNA. Now, they carry this out by identifying the pathogen, 
attaching to it, ingesting, and then digesting it. But life is not always as simple as it seems, because once in a while, our bodies come across pathogens that are so powerful that our innate immunity is unable to actually defend itself. So what happens then? Well, our pathogens, our, our phagocytes go to war. Once at war, they begin to learn what our pathogens, uh, these pathogens work. They learn their systems, how they cause the infection, and thus go through a morph morphological change that allows them to identify them the next time. Now, this becomes our adaptive immunity. Now, adaptive immunity is basically our body's ability to identify specific pathogens. So you have to come across the pathogen in order for you to become immune to it. So in short, you can basically ask yourself, if someone crawled from under a rock and asked you, do you know who the man of steel is? Well, just stand there, hold your, sh sh your, your, your hips and say, well, I get attacked by vicious pathogens all the time. So I actually do come close to being the man of steel. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually did genetics as a module. So there was these interesting things that came, keep coming up that um, we can actually teach our body to defend itself against pathogens. So immunity was such a big thing because um, we can actually go to the pathogen, get genes from, um, remove uh, disease-causing um, genes from the pathogen and give you the actual disease. So we actually make you sick to teach your body how to defend yourself against a more... Um, vicious pathogen, you know? So that, that's where I actually picked up the interest. And can I ask, uh, why did you pick the Superman analogy? I mean, what is it that inspired you to go with that? Oh yeah, um, now Superman is, everybody knows Superman. He's this indestructible force. And I think as human beings, we, we tend to uh, limit ourselves to saying, yeah, we're just man, you know? But in actual fact, we actually go through more than Superman actually goes through because Superman is just actually a thought and you are actually more super than the Man of Steel himself. So that's why I chose the energy to show you that you are way more than the Man of Steel. Evolution of pathogens are quite interesting how they can adapt very rapidly to the environment in which they're living. Um, how can we um, best take advantage of the fact that they're rapid adaptations? What can we use such, how can we use the adaptations we see in these pathogens, viruses? Um, to answer your question, um, can I refer to something I learned? Um, there was a flu that happened um, mostly in Europe where about 60 million people died. The Spanish flu, yeah. And the sa you, you had the same genes from the Spanish flu you had in the recent bird flu. So um, I think what we didn't know back then to what we know now is actually um, help helping us to actually understand the evolution there because um, I'm, I'm going lost for words, um, English. Um, could you please repeat the question, please? No, it's all right. You, you, you're it's, it's interesting how we can look at how these different pathogens evolve mm -hmm. and what can we learn from the evolving pathogens? How quickly can we create um, solutions to these rapidly? Because some well, evolve far more rapidly than others yeah. and we have to deal with these. Yeah, but by looking at the rate in which they, 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 they are evolving, I think um, it becomes important to actually uh, th try and think forward, you know, because we can try and predict what, would be, what the pattern would be like in the next 10 years. So we actually start combating the, the, the pathogen before it actually becomes something way more than it is. Yeah. I suspect there's a pathogen behind you. Uh, I am that oh. pathogen. <laughs> oh. <Okay. laughs> you keep your distance for the sake of your health. One more time, he survived the kryptonite of our judges, but he's not immune to your praise. You. Raven Motsi Wabangwe. Yes, there is some line of sight stuff when you're creeping up behind the finalists. So second, we come to our Italian champion, Marco Farigo, a student of mathematics at the University of Pisa, well, sorry, Pisa, where he's developing an analytical model for the evolution of tumorous cells. Uh, we're not trying to find answers to cancers. Marco attempts to make various mathematical uh, concepts fun and interactive for children and adults via exhibitions, workshops, games, and now, of course, via FameLab 2. He should be ready as his three minutes are about to start. So, on your Marcos, get set, Ferrigo. Okay. 
The flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil can set off a tornado in Texas. What is the mathematics behind this catchy phrase? To find out, I will describe to you an experiment that, yes, you may try at home. This experiment involves the typical mathematical tool, soap bubbles. <laughs> and the first part of the experiment is extremely simple. Just blow your bubbles and watch carefully at the outcome. So, count how many bubbles form, where they go, and how long they live. The second part of the experiment is a challenge. Try to reproduce exactly the same bubble behavior. Okay, what can you do to do that? You can try to reproduce exactly the same initial conditions. So you will stand in exactly the same spot, put your stick at exactly the same height, and use the same blow intensity end. But when you try yourself, you will find out that any shot is completely different from the others. And after a couple of seconds, the bubble behavior is completely unpredictable. What happens is that the first and the second shot follow a similar path for a couple of seconds. But then some small differences in the initial conditions, such as a different inclination of your stick, of your blow intensity, result have time to evolve and unbeacon and result in totally different outcomes. This experiment shows us how the meteorolog meteorologist work is done. A meteorologist collects data about air pressure, air density, wind intensity, puts them in powerful computers where sophisticated mathematical models reproduce the interaction between atmospherical agents. The result of such a, a computation is that accelerated multimedial version of reality you see when you watch uh, weather forecast programs on the internet or on TV. But again, what happens here is that reality and its simulation can follow a similar path just for a certain amount of time. And then some small differences in the initial conditions which I measured have time to evolve and unbeacon and result in totally different outcomes. And that is how the small differences made by the flight of a small butterfly, if not specifically measured, can end up in an unpredictable, unpredicted tornado. With modern technologies and mathematical models, the edge of predictable is about 48 hours. But how far can this edge be pushed? Well, this is a really difficult prediction to make. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, here I am. Actually, the analogy is, is well studied. I mean, I, had, I just had to find an example of a, of a complex system, so of a highly nonlinear differential equation system. And, <laughs> of course, anyone will think of soap bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway, it's, it's quite studied. It's well known that soap bubbles are an example of, of the butterfly effect. Is it Maynard Smith who said that uh, modeling is doomed to succeed? What do you feel about that comment? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't understand the question, sorry. If, if modeling, because th some people just don't believe computer models. Oh. And yeah, I know it's, it's amazing, because I use a lot of modeling in my work, and it's quite depressing. Um, but what, what is your answer to someone who says, oh, it's a computer model? Well, you how can you validate it? You just show them they work. But so. How do you validate your model? What might you use to show, for instance, the beautiful, the elegant complexities of weather with these multiple parameters going on? Uh -huh. um, how can you actually validate, show that your model uh, can produce a predictable, even if it's within 48 hours of an event, how could you validate your model was correct? Well, first of all, by showing how it works. I mean, showing the outcomes and showing, well, look, I'll, I will now make prediction for the weather for the next two days and then we'll, we'll check together if it works, which is what scientists actually, actually do. So 
it's always a matter of involving the people in, in what you actually do that convinces them of, of, of the goodness of, of your work. Another way would be to, to explain why you, why you chose some parameters, why you give some weight to other parameters, and this could be, could be possible. It's, it's more difficult, that's for sure, but maybe more interesting, and this is what we do, what we are interested in, so also that could be possible. Further research needed. He's managed to soft soap the judges. Please thank Marco Ferrigo. <laughs> Marco Ferrigo, anagram of Go Face Mirror. Uh, now, from Italy, we head uh, west across the Med to our Spaniard in the works, and it's Ricardo More, currently completing his uh, Master's in Molecular Biology at Barcelona University. According to his own biog, Ricardo More was a very fat kid, but something happened to his metabolism, and he's now a horny hunk who studies adipose tissue. <laughs> or, in other words, fat again. He claims he's so fond of both researching and eating fat that he's hoping to find tons of it in Cheltenham. It's not the usual reason for going to the Science Festival, but I don't think he's going to struggle from some of the catering outlets I've seen here. Uh, rather more tricky will be what he manages to chew over in the next three minutes. Will he get nervous and put a bit of his panic into Hispanic, or will it all be plain Spain sailing for Ricardo More? <laughs> I'm counting fat people. <laughs> Obese audience, you are the target of a terrorist conspiracy. There are beings in your spare tire crying out for revenge. Imagine I took a closer glimpse at my role of fat, if I had any, and we looked through a microscope. We will see thousands of white spheres. The adipocytes, the cells responsible for storing the fat in the body, and those little bastards do their job very, very well. But they are misunderstood. You must think they want us to put on weight. No, they want us to be fit, like me. Look at this sexy body, sculpted by spinning on Latin readings. But imagine I follow a Tesco's pastry diet, and I become obese. My adipocytes would store more fat. When a sphere increases its volume, its surface grows in a much smaller proportion. Our cells breathe and do so across their surface. Therefore, as the size of an adipocyte increases, its need for oxygen increases, but its ability to capture it grows at a much lower rate. This obese adipocyte and its mates are suffocating, but they take revenge. Yes, fat, so they do it. They send an SOS signal. <laughs> Attracting an army of thousands of cells from the immune system, putting up an inflammatory response. The role of fat of an obese person is inflamed, releasing molecules called cytokines, which are like missiles, which flow through the blood vessels and bombard our liver and muscles. Liver and muscles feed on glucose, which gets in through thousands of small doors like this. The key? Insulin. But cytokines dun 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 Lock the door. They block the lock. Insulin cannot open the door, so glucose cannot enter. Thus, while liver and muscles are starving, glucose builds up in the body. So to restore some order, the pancreas, our hero, releases more insulin and more and more until it collapses. Type 2 diabetes mellitus. The revenge of the adipocytes. Because revenge is a dish best served with bacon. Thank you very much. Mad as a box of frogs. I love it. <laughs> My God, do you, do you, can we hire out for parties for children? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, no, um, sorry. Do you carry insurance, by the way? <laughs> no. <laughs> sorry, I'll pass over to one of my colleagues. <laughs> I, I want to hear more of it. This was actually a very entertaining. And what made you choose to take this particular approach to it? I mean, it's something that I think we can all relate to, um, but you actually chose to take a more humorous sort of anthropomorphic, making them come alive, you know, creating characters for the different kinds of cells and things. Why did you choose that approach? I don't know. Maybe it's my way to see the world. I, don't <laughs> I, I didn't really choose it like, okay, I will explain the mechanism behind diabetes, uh, so I will choose these objects. No, it was coming to my mind, like sometimes where I was uh, almost uh, sleepy or things like that. It, <laughs> it's like in my imagination, I can't really. But I, I think I, I use always to make personalizations, like treat the, my, my objects or part of, of the body like, like humans, like characters. I like this way to tell uh, stories to people. It's an area of research that obviously is of like worldwide interest. Yes. You know. um, which aspect do you think um, deserves most most focus? Because, I mean, for instance, my, my sister is is very very overweight, and she feels incredibly <laughs> targeted. You know, and, and and the focus sometimes. I mean, sometimes she, she opens a paper and feels as if she's being sort of personally. Uh, you know, attacked, um, yes. and it's it's a very very difficult area, but a very important one to tackle. Because I sit there thinking, you need to lose that weight. Yes, it, it's it's very difficult because it's true that sometimes you you can offend people. That there are a lot of people who who feel offended by 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 these things. But in my case, I I treat always to do it with a kind of white humor, and. Maybe I, I think it's difficult to understand that someone could make humor about that, but I really use humor to, as a way to uh, keep the attention of the public because I really want to express the word that obesity is a really harmful illness. Okay, so we sometimes mm, forget this, that it's not something just aesthetic. Uh, if you tell someone cancer, it's okay, it's very bad, but obesity is seriously harmful. It's very, very dangerous. Uh, as I told you, you have a chronic inflammatory process in a very big part of your body. So even if, I, if someone can be offended by it, I, I, I'm apologize if this is the <laughs> case, but uh, it's a way to, to say to the people, okay, look at me, Let's hear this, this, listen this message, please <laughs> take care. call someone an adipocyte now as opposed to a little <laughs> bastard. Yes. I love that. And, and uh, adipocytes are our, really funny. I requisite on the swear box for this evening, probably, yes. just to be case. Can we please say, Ricardo More, has he got more than a fat chance in the final? You want some candies? <laughs> oh, that's setting the bar. That could, reba that could rebound on you, Ricardo. Uh, and Ricardo More... I am our record as well. And uh, Maggie's sister, if you're watching, hey, we, you know, we, we're all thinking of you. <laughs> now, and no sooner does our Spanish winner vanish than we're ready to check out our Czech. Matthias uh, Kriet uh, used to dream of one day being a professional ice hockey star, but although he still plays for fun, as luck, puck, and pluck has it, he turned out to have greater and marginally less violent talent for medicine. And he's currently skating towards a PhD in the Faculty of Medicine in Prague. Uh, Matthias says he wants to share his enthusiasm for science and prove that scientists aren't just weirdos hiding in labs. Let's hope the next three minutes are enough to convince you he's right. Make your applause go right off the top of the hockey stick curve for our Czech champion, Matthias Kriet. <laughs> Dear friends of science, you are probably wondering if it's a boy or a girl. <laughs> but what you should be wondering is whether I am expecting a healthy boy or a healthy girl. Our patients are newborns, 
suffering from disorders in the synthesis of purines. These disorders have neurological manifestations and include delayed development, seizures, and autism manifestations. These symptoms are common for many diseases, and therefore, the correct diagnosis is very important in order to prevent wrong treatment. Our aim is to find these disorders before they manifest themselves. Ideally, we would use, uh, right after the birth, some method which would show us that there is something wrong with the baby by testing a suitable biological material like, like, oh, yes, uh, like urine. Okay, uh, here, here we have a sample from a potential patient. And now we have to collect a set of samples from healthy patients. Uh, Madam, yes, you, sitting with your legs crossed, uh, <laughs> would you provide me a sample, please? And you, sir, uh, would you pee into this tube for me? And I will create the last sample myself. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Th thanks a lot. Wow, you, you really needed to go, didn't you? You are very kind. Now, we will analyze all the samples. For that, we will use mass spectrometer, or as I like to call it, major mass spec. This machine can accurately measure the molecular mass of a wide range of substances and provide us very detailed information about them. From that, we can calculate the concentration of substances in each sample. Let's find out the results of our healthy patient and compare them with the results of our potential patient. Oh no, here we see high levels of succinyl aminoimmune carboxy I might ribose. Come on, <laughs> hurry up. We have to go to the doctor and tell him that your disease is based on the disorders in the purine synthesis. I'm sure he will know what to do, thanks to our fabulous work. What exactly are you looking for? What are you testing the baby for? I didn't quite catch that at the very beginning. Uh, succinyl aminoimmune carboxyamide ribose. <laughs> it's some kind of supercolor fragilistic exploidosis. Uh, uh, what is it and what does it do? I mean, why are you looking for that thing in particular? Uh, because bef before our body can build up the DNA, first of all, it has to uh, synthesize the basic building blocks. And especially, uh, the two, two basic building blocks which I'm uh, doing my research on, uh, they are built in 10 separate steps. And if there is any one of those steps, if it's uh, broken, it can bring up the disease. And for us, it's very important to find out in, uh, in which, uh, in which uh, step it is and what kind of disease it is, because very often doctors don't uh, treat the correct uh, uh, disease which is based on this uh, synthesis. I'm gonna be mean. How, how do you explain to me how the mass spectrometer works? Okay. <laughs> Basically, uh, you placed placed a sample into the mass spectrometer. Uh, it's uh, this this sample gets uh, in very small drops, like almost gas. Then comes uh, comes the uh, the high energy voltage uh, power, which gives this uh, this sample a uh, um, um, uh, charge, uh, which can be to the whole whole uh, whole molecule or it can cut the molecules on smaller molecules, but the point is you got the charge and some fragments. And these charged fragments are running through the, the whole machine where are the magnets, and they separately make the, the fragments uh, in line uh, based on the mass and charge, which comes to the detector, and then you see, you see which, which mass uh, you were detecting. So it can really help you to find out uh, what was in the sample, but not always. Thank but you. That was, that was only because... He only asked you that because you asked for a urine sample as well. <laughs> Matthias Creek, please, again, thank you. And I heard that his mum's sister is here, but we need to keep her away from him because it's very important that Matthias and auntie of Matthias never meet. 
Oh, go on. Now, okay, moving swiftly on and southeast by a few hundred miles, we reach our Bulgarian semi finalist, Alexei Mitev. Uh, like Matthias, studying medicine. Unlike him, rather than ice hockey, his interests extend to existentialism, uh, writing poetry, and playing piano to concert hall and orchestral at levels, and he's only 19. If all that sounds extraordinary, extraordinary, you can be slightly reassured by the fact that one of his interests is intoxicating agents, which is pretty much the norm for anybody of that age, really. Uh, Alexi says his greatest dream is to always have dreams, but now it's time to wake up to the reality of being in the first international semi-final of FameLab. He won in Bulgaria despite arguing with his host while he was being introduced. I watched the video. I'm glad to hear that hasn't happened tonight. Please welcome Alexei Mitev. <laughs> Dear hum human eyes, how vain you are. How dare you to cheat the human beings with your own concept of light and color. It is not you who see, it is the human. There is no light and color for you, but we blindly continue to believe you. Now I'll tell you why. Our functions are multiple. In retina, there are two types of photoreceptor cells. Broad cells, which can tell the difference between light and color, and cone cells, which can differentiate the colors. When light rays reach the retina, then vitamin, A's, that vitamin A changes itself in this little transformation uh, of the protein opsin. This protein opsin and vitamin A are part of the rhodopsin, which takes part in the plasma membrane of these uh, rod cells. The good news is, when the whole system works, then I can see you. But uh, in fact, in most of the cases, this protein option can mutate, and uh, uh, then I can't see light. Light is an electromagnetic wave, and this it can bring color with it. And uh, uh, here, the color option mutation is similar to the previous one. Me, as a spokesman of the Caucasian race, I'm the most colorless person of this world because the possibility of option mutation is up to 70%. And uh, that's why I have to recompensate this. Keep calm and uh, be careful. Care uh, careful. Um, if I were to say I uh, wouldn't be um, so nice, I would be so restricted, disappointed to have no opportunities to uh, be naturally good in something because there's someone much better than me compared in the nature uh, and uh, uh, much better with his vision. I'm talking about snakes. And the difference comes because only they uh, can see in the different spectrum of light because of their ability to activate their option in, uh, uh, with the help of heat. They can see uh, like um, uh, li a live heat camera and can't get and can catch movements so tiny uh, to uh, micrometers and they have even uh, tiny layers in their eyes uh, and their eyes are reflectable and now they explain the fact why they aren't uh, uh, live uh, snakes photographers uh, but uh, uh, talking about nature defects uh, there are people who live uh, on borders between normal eye vision and stairs vision I'm talking about James Bond and uh, his former brothers. With help only with two lenses, they can see like snakes, with human eyes. And that's because they can see in the infrared spectrum of light. Now you understand uh, how hard it is to be a uh, slayer chased by a um, well equipped agent uh, whose technology is based on uh, uh, sensitivity mechanisms and also human eyes. I uh, forgive you. Now I understand why it said beauty is in the eye of the beholder. the topic that was the very first thing and uh, after the construction of the, the whole presentation I was just going to ask you know, what, what, what aspect of this subject fascinates you most 
Uh, as you understood, as I am a medical student and I like to work as an ophthalmologist, um, this product here is something additional because um, I have another project for the 25th uh, Medical uh, International con uh, Conference in uh, Berlin this September, and uh, that's why I decided to uh, tell you something like this. It's interesting how us humans have seen color, where for mammals, many don't see in color. Um, do you think our evolutionary past gives us any clues as to why we see such variation in color vision within mammals? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in uh, people, there's variation in colors because uh, of the genes. For example, uh, I'm of those genes uh, who are rarely seen because uh, oh, I'm with blonde hair, with fair complexion, uh, like my mother, but my father is uh, from those genes uh, who are... Um, seen uh, in most of the cases. Uh, that's for the human. And uh, for the other mammals, it's uh, not so of um, great importance uh, because uh, uh, for them the struggle for life was bigger in the jungle. And uh, uh, in our life, the struggle is a little bit different, not in the jungle, uh, but it looks like to it. <laughs> <laughs> Alexi Mitev. I think Phil's getting a reputation for asking the really tricky questions. How does a mass spectrometer work? The difference between colour and black and white vision. I think you can get a few more. I want to buy one like that. It looks great. Yeah, it did look good as well. <laughs> and uh, Alexi Mitev, by the way, anagram of my exit leave. So he has left, but will you be seeing him again in Thursday's final? We are now in the middle of the semi-final, and also we go straight to the middle of Europe as well. It's Switzerland. They continue their grand fame lab tradition of never actually having anybody Swiss as their winner. <laughs> Uh, last year, I'm not entirely sure there was anybody actually Swiss even in their final. This year, there definitely were, but they lost out to non-Swiss Ms. Jennifer Fowley. Yes, Ms., one of only two in tonight's competition. It's just the luck of the draw. There's a lot more women in the semi-final tomorrow. Uh, Jennifer studied physics at St. Andrews. She's now doing a PhD in condensed matter physics in Geneva. Uh, not just an orator, though, she's also a creator. Uh, although, depending on mood and source material, what she creates might be a painting, a sculpture, a story, or a meal. Let's see what creation of imagination she can serve up in three minutes to make us Geneva believers in Jennifer Fowley. <laughs> Albert Einstein. The name is synonymous with genius. Everyone knows his face, and they even make toys of him. Now, I bet you're expecting me to go on to talk about E equals MC squared or something like that, but, but no. What I want to talk about is one of his discoveries which was literally more down to earth. When I came on stage right now, I walked in a straight line like any sober person would, and I didn't weave about all over the place. But rivers, Rivers never go in a straight line, even if it's the quickest route to the sea. They do weave about. Rivers meander. And it was Einstein, a genius theoretical physicist, inspired while stirring his cup of tea, who realized why. You see, because of the nature of the landscape, there are always obstacles that the water has to flow around, and this creates the small bends. So let's start here with um, one of my latest artistic endeavors. So, in a small bend, the water feels a force towards the outside of the bend, and this makes the earth of the outer riverbank seriously eroded. This earth is then dropped on the inside bank, and this constant shifting of earth from outside to inside bank makes the bend grow and grow and grow. And Einstein, when he was stirring his cup of tea, he noticed that the leaves pile up in the middle of the cup, and it's exactly the same physics. So, starting with small bends, we end up with huge meanders, and you end up with a loopy river. Now, all rivers are loopy, but uh, geographers have a way of measuring the loopiness of the river, and this is the total distance that the water travels divided by the straight line distance from the source of the river to the mouth. And they call it the meandering ratio. So, for a perfectly straight river, it would be one, and for a very loopy river, it would be much more than one. And um, some geographers in the 1990s went through all the rivers in the world rather tediously measuring the meandering ratios. And there was a huge amount of variation, of course. But then they measured the average. And do you know what they found? That the average river on Earth has a meandering ratio of 3.141592.
do you recognize this number? Okay, if you did high school maths, then you should, because it's pi, the circumference of a circle divided by the diameter. And it's Einstein's theory that really predicts this. This constant outwards force on the river bends makes the bends like parts of circles. And in nature, where there are circles, there's pi. Now, Einstein was the perfect scientist, because he had this insatiable curiosity for the universe. And this includes everything from black holes to rivers. He deserves to have an action figure. But of everything that he did, I like this the most, because it shows us that maths is not just foreign symbols on a blackboard. It is real, physical nature, and it's all around us. made to wade through rivers most of my education. It was awful. <laughs> That's what they do to geologists. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'd actually heard of Einstein's teacup uh, analogy that he'd been stirring it. I, I had not realized that it was tied to rivers. I mean, how did you discover that? And what is the link there? Yeah, well, his, his original paper where he makes the teacup analogy is actually um, prompted by the, the question of rivers. He begins the paper by saying that rivers always always um, meander and they never follow the, the you know the the fastest route downhill um, so he was already thinking about that and um, me I heard the story a long long time ago and it's always stuck in my head because I just think it's such a fantastic story and some someone with a as important uh, an impact on the, on the scientific community as Einstein to do something like this just because he was interested I mean nobody was paying him to do this he was just looking at rivers and thinking, this is weird. And I really like that. It's what science is about, really. I was going to be really mean and start asking about Reynolds numbers and fruit numbers and hydrodynamics, but I'm not going to. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I, I could I have answered. <laughs> I, I would, that would be mean, but I'm, I'm, I'm really interested because Archimedes, now you say good old Einstein did it. Well, Archimedes wrote this rather fantastic book called Method, Method and Mechanical Theorem, mm -hmm. where he diagnoses, sort of working out um, infinity and such things, but he played with circles in that. Uh, have you ever come across any of Archimedes' work in relation to No, I've never heard behavior? it mentioned. Okay. No, I've never heard it mentioned. In, in, reading, mm. about, in reading about this um, theory, from, from what I read, it sounded like nobody had really thought about it until Einstein said, why is nobody asking why? <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> how would you demonstrate this to a bunch Archimedes of kids? Just because if you've got a bunch of 10-year-olds in yeah. front of you, like this, um, what would you... <laughs> What, how would you demonstrate In a few words. In a few words, yes, sorry. Um, I don't think it's such a difficult talk for, for a 10-year-old to understand. I mean, if I had more time, I would probably include a, a demonstration with a sandbox and pouring water. And even with a sandbox, you can start to see the, the water going like this and, and um, maybe show some photographs of, of rivers and they can really see how they, they really loop around. And uh, I think that it's something that's actually quite easy to grasp for a it's difficult for a child. Behind, isn't it? Yeah. But with her <laughs> with her remashed cover version of River Deep Mountain Pie, please thank Jennifer Fowley. Given a t-shirt, I was expecting us to talk about diesel power. Uh, now, we're over halfway through, and we're on to our honorary anomaly. Uh, it's our sort of first ever FameLab champion from the USA. There has been a FameLab just for NASA before, but this was the first truly national competition, and it's resulted in our first truly national proper American FameLab winner, Lyle Tomlinson. Uh, Lyle's a graduate student at Stony Brook University in Long Island, New York, researching how exercise affects stem cells in our brains. Uh, when he's not stretching his mind to that, Lyle says he's a jogger, a blogger, and a regular loser and player of board games. <laughs> Being used to losing could come in handy, but he's still going to play to win tonight. It's our US champ, Lyle Tomlinson. <laughs> Children can be really awesome to talk to sometimes. For instance, my little cousin, sometimes he says really funny things during conversations or makes these great observations I would have never expected. Other times, he can be like a little question cannon rattling off a series of, but why, but why? Not in an attempt to understand what I'm saying, but just to keep us talking. 
You see, although socializing can sometimes be kind of trying for adults, it's actually really important for the child's development, to which my cousin might add. But why? <laughs> well, childhood is a critical period. It's a time when the brain is still developing, still forming connections. In one of these areas of the brain, the prefrontal cortex is still developing into the child's 20s. And it's really important for controlling impulsive behavior and for making complex decisions. Unfortunately, putting the brakes on a system like this by not providing adequate social experiences during childhood could result in permanent defects. For instance, in socially isolated or neglected children, they tend to suffer from weak decision making and poor impulse control. But also, in their prefrontal cortex, they found that there are defects in myelin areas. But why does myelin matter? <laughs> well, myelin is it's really important for the brain. It, it helps it work faster. And it works kind of like this coat. You see, as I stand here, I'm getting hot much faster than the rest of you, not only because this coat is sexy, <laughs> but because it helps prevent heat from escaping. In the same way, neurons in your brain, they get their own sexy coat, myelin, which it's not for heat, though. It helps prevent electrical signals important for controlling bodies, controlling movements. It helps, it prevents them from escaping. And in doing so, it promotes the normal development and the normal control of your body. Unfortunately, in the brains of socially isolated and neglected children, we think they may be losing these coats or maybe not be able to make enough of them at all. This work has also been supplemented in mice, um, rats, and monkeys. And we found that when you socially isolate animals, just as if you socially isolate humans, there are also defects in these myelin areas. But not only that, they found that there might be a gene that's involved in all of this. So we're trying to figure out what we can do with this gene, what we can find out about social isolation to make it so that we could potentially do something about this. Because right now, the right discovery could make sure that these permanent defects, like poor impulse control and lack of um, uh, decision making, we can make sure that these are not so permanent. So there is something you can do right now. The next time a child comes up to you and asks, but why? Just tell them, because what's a few trying minutes out of your day could actually make a lifetime of difference to them. Thank you. I'm so tempted to just say, but why? <laughs> but I'm not going to because I actually, you, this is a very interesting uh, a topic because it's kind of where nature meets nurture in a sense. You mentioned, you know, a certain possible genetic component and you certainly talked about brain development and the importance of myelin. But those things, from what you're saying, are influenced by s environment, to, to in, namely the extent of socialization. Maybe you could uh, give me a, a concrete example of exactly what that looks like. Right. So you're, she's bringing up a very important point. Um, she, she's saying that nurture, the outside environment, might uh, affect it through socialization. It may be what's contributing to this myelin. And we actually know this. Um, we know that neurons, when they talk, they send out messages, uh, chemical messages, neurotransmitters, which can actually affect these myelin-forming cells. They've actually shown in mice that <laughs> these crazy mites, where you can shine lights on their neurons and make them activate. When they activate these neurons, you find that the cells that make myelin make more myelin and they're more developed. So socializing could just be a pathway for these neurons to talk to these myelin-forming cells. Socializing is another stimulus just like vision, I mean, just like uh, light, just like sound, and it could be coming in from these pathways to make these neurons talk to these myelin-forming cells. And I think that's how nature is sort of meeting nurture in this sense, or at least the outside environment to these, uh, to these myelin-forming cells. How do you conduct a nerve conduction study without um, invasive slicing through the brains to check for the myelin sheaths? Um, so when you're talking about it, so you want humans or? So, yeah, let's so pick, a, yeah, because there are a number of ways. To humans. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll go with humans. Um, so. So uh, a few of the studies that I was referencing, what they were doing was they, was look, uh, they were looking at the brain using something called positron emission technology. Um, and, and basically, or uh, tomography, sorry. Um, and so how they did this was they basically put people in a machine that recorded radioactive decay. And so how they got this to work was they made, they, they made sure that people didn't eat for a while so their glucose levels were low. 
after they were, made sure their glucose levels were low, they injected them with radioactive glucose. <laughs> yeah, I know it sounds weird, but this is how it works. And it's, it's not lethal. Um, so they injected them with radioactive glucose, and they saw where this glucose went to. So the idea is that where the glucose goes to, the prefrontal cortex, if there's a lot more of it there, then more of the prefrontal cortex is active. So they saw in that these socially isolated children, there was actually less of the glucose that was active or radioactive. So that's how they figured out that, okay, socially isolated children using their prefrontal cortices less, and regular children using them more. That's awesome. Thank you. Cool. For the indelibly memorable Lyle Tomlinson. And Lyle Tomlinson is a guy of Top Lots Myelin. I had to, there's no E, but Myelin, you can just about get there as well. So, um, uh, I also, was anybody else but me wondering why the coat was buttoned up one off all the way through that? Yeah. It's easier to get off. It's easier to get off, fine. Well, that, that, later, Lyle, later. So, uh, uh, Lyle was sort of our first US Fame Lab winner. Next, we have someone who is definitely, indubitably, undoubtedly our first Korean winner, Wung Bae Ji. As well as being an astronomy student, uh, Wung Bei describes himself as being a pioneer of pop science in our nation, and he is. He's a founder of a student organization called Would You Like, which publishes magazines and runs web pages encouraging huge interest in everything to do with outer space. They already have 14,000 likes on Facebook, and it's nice because the name is a multilingual pun, because Would You Like sounds like the Korean word meaning universe. By my maths, he's come about a 40th of the distance from the Earth to the Moon to be here tonight. So please give an extra large, extraterrestrial welcome to Wung Bei Ji. Is there any life beyond Earth? The Earth is home to all living creatures, including us. So I think this is the most beautiful piece of art in the universe. To survive on this planet, you need hydration. No doubt, we can't live for even a week without liquid water. Fortunately, the Earth is filled with water. The Earth orbits around the sun. If we were closer to the sun, the sun would heat up our home and make it very hot, so all of the oceans would evaporate. On the other hand, if we were farther from the sun, the sunshine would be more faint and the earth would freeze like Pluto. Fortunately for us, the earth revolves around the sun at the perfect distance. So it seems that the earth is a unique and artistic planet in the entire universe. But that's not true. <laughs> Who knows? Some aliens may live on other planets and hold their own fame lab, Milky Way, or whatever. <laughs> Let's imagine a planet orbiting around a distant star. The planet blocks light from the star periodically. Because of this periodic eclipse, the star blinks. So it's very easy to find an orbiting planet near the blinking star. But one more question remains. Do oceans exist? In order to find out, we need to make sure that the distance of the planet from the star is artistic like the Earth. If the planet was adjacent to the star, the star's strong gravity would grip the planet tightly, so the planet would accelerate very fast. However, if the planet was far away from the star, its gravitational hold would be looser, and then the planet would orbit more slowly. This means that it's very easy to calculate the distance between the star and the planet just by measuring how often the star blinks. Therefore, we can confirm whether it's a desert planet, or a giant ice wall, or an artistic planet like the Earth. Enough energy is coming from the sun and we can get hydration from liquid water. Energy and hydration, they make an artistic harmony and complete the Earth. <laughs> and, okay, thanks, and to be sure, there are other masterpieces as excellent as the Earth. You know what? 
Just a month ago, we first found a new habitable planet. Now, we are not alone. We are alien planets are no longer science fiction. Thank you. I guess uh, this was, I, I love the topic, um, and, and you explained it very, very well, particularly you know, how we can spot an exoplanet and how we can measure distance. Um, distance, of course, and it is not the only way, not the only criteria for life. What are some of the others? Uh, what, what are some other things that would need to be ex need to exist in order to find a version of life on another planet? What would life look like? Uh, well, of course, we found we found many habitable planets which suitable to human. So we think we need we need which we need some planets which can we live in there. So I think probably the aliens is similar to us as you as you see you know, many blockbusters movies you know. So, of course, they have two eyes and two legs and two arms, of course. Yes, not, not many different from to us. What do you think the chances are of us absolutely identifying life on another planet in my lifetime, given that I've probably got a good 25 years left? <laughs> what do you reckon the odds are? Well... Maybe the probability, the probability to find alien planets is very low. <laughs> but if we do not anything, the probability is just zero. This is the main reason why I study astronomy. So of course we took, we will, we will need very long time to find them. But I know the answer, and we are closer to the answer. And if we do find them, we will be dragging them into Fame Lab as well. So we will have the intergalactic <laughs> Fame Lab. One more time for the blinking good Wung Bei Ji. I told you he punned in Korean. I didn't know he punned in English as well. Now, anti penultimately, it's Portugal, and their winner is postdoc physicist Marta Santos. Uh, fascinated by science, since as a small child she discovered ours is not the only planet. See, you should have seen Wung Bei Ji even earlier. Uh, this has led her across the cosmos to the University of Aviro, where she's studying how the structural properties of complex networks affect the dynamics of processes taking place in them. Something we all think about from time to time. Uh, Marta Santos's best anagram is not as smart as, but not as smart as what. You decide after 180 first-rate seconds within the complex structural dynamics of FameLab champion from Portugal, Marta Santos. <laughs> It is often said that you can't have too many friends, but does it really work that way? In the 90s, a scientist named Robin Dunbar realized that there is a relationship between the size of our brain and the number of friends we can keep at the same time. This relationship is determined by the size of this outer layer of the brain, which has several folds and is a few millimeters thick. It is called neocortex. This is the part of the brain we use for language, to form opinions, and to make decisions, just to mention a few examples. So Dunbar began by noticing this relationship for other primates. He noticed that the larger the size of the neocortex of a given species, the larger the number of social ties that species could maintain at the same time. This number is around 20 for monkeys, it rises for about 50 to chimpanzees, and for humans, 150, yes. 150 is Dunbar's prediction for the approximate number of social ties that our brain can process simultaneously. It is one of our many limitations, like not being able to breathe underwater or not being able to fly. And this is because a friendship requires not only time, which is limited, but also requires us to process and cross-index different information, such as where you met, friendships and enmities with other friends of yours, significant dates, and this limitation is a consequence of our evolution. Our ancestors, almost 200,000 years ago, began by living in small communities whose average size is estimated to be close to this number. In fact, nowadays, we can find this number in various contexts that require us to maintain social ties. 
It is, for instance, the average size of a military company, which is the smallest autonomous military unit. And it is also the maximum size reached by the offices of some companies, above which the company decides to split the office in two and open a new one. Of course, 150 is just an approximation. Shyer or more sociable people will deviate from this average. And some researchers have proposed slightly different numbers. But the message remains. The number of social ties that we can keep at the same time is limited. And it is a consequence of our evolution over thousands of years. Therefore, social networks like Facebook, where we can easily accumulate lots of friends, what they do is they gather in the same place, connections with people we know very well, and also people we don't know so well. And social networks help us to maintain friendships we already have, because they remind us of birthdays and important achievements, and they also allow us to share information very quickly. But will social networks allow us to expand this limitation of our brain? Or will they have the opposite effect? As yet, we just don't know. Thank you. Yeah, that is it's a very interesting topic, this one, in the age of things like Twitter and Facebook and thousands of followers. Yeah. And so do you think, essentially, perhaps we're wasting our time with some of those things? That they can support relationships, but they can't develop them. The idea we can have more than 100 I think it depends on uh, how you want to, what's the purpose of what you want to use Facebook or Twitter for. So for maintaining friendships, it's, it's a good tool like a calculator and allows you to make calculations more easily, but it doesn't make you better at math necessarily. So uh, a Facebook or Twitter will allow you to remember data about your friends, but uh, in part you learn your uh, social abilities by experience. So you're lacking your experience if you only use social networks. But you can also, uh, through your lots and thousands of connections in Facebook, you m m many times are connected to people that are not close friends. So you only talk with them like once in a year or not even once in a year. But they have s different interests from you sometimes. And you can learn different things. You, those called weak ties can also teach you some things. So it depends on the use that you want to give to social networks, I think. The, the human brain is, is beautifully adept at compensating for injuries and classic ones where areas of the brain are affected and other areas take into account what's happened. With the neocortex, do we see other changes, heightened areas which compensate if that is damaged, which enables a person to still be socially engaged, as it were? Well, uh, from what I read, so I'm not a specialist in, in this area. I, I learned about it because I was very curious about this when I first heard about it. For what I know, there are specific areas in the neocortex with the corresponding insights, so the neocortex is just the exterior part, that are more devoted to social um, abilities, so to socialize with, with your partners, with your peers. So if you, ha if you have damage in there, you will be impaired, so you'll have difficulties in, in socializing. I'm just not sure if uh, you have the plasticity enough in your brain to overcome those, uh, those damages. I think not. But I, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, let's part as friends, at least for now, with Marta Santos. And Jennifer, you talked about you know, coming here and nicking ideas. I am so going to steal that analogy about the calculator for, for Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. I <laughs> right, we're down to our two remaining semi-finalists, including one Romanian semi-finalist. Uh, just days ago, Bogdan Georgiou became their 2014 Fame Lab winner after beating the rest in Bucharest. Uh, Bogdan was happily working as a translator until one night he got to see Saturn through a telescope and the rings changed everything. He decided his future lay in the stars and he's now switched to studying astronomy in the physics faculty at Romania's oldest universities. He's here tonight to talk about dark matter. Please welcome Bogdan Georgiou. <laughs> Would you like to know exactly what dark matter is? So would I. <laughs> it even sounds mysterious, doesn't it? Dark matter. Like it was taken from a story filled with knights, wizards, and dragons. But that's not what it is about, unfortunately for all the geeks here, me included. <laughs> well, there are only two problems with the name dark matter. The word dark and the word matter. 
the word dark doesn't actually mean dark. It means we cannot see it, we don't know what it is, or where it comes from, really. The word matter is very misleading because we don't know what it is. We have not seen it. We can only see the influence it has on other objects, on other visible objects in the universe. So a better name for it would be unexplained gravity because you'll see that's actually what it is. In our universe, stuff likes to orbit other heavier stuff. That's just how it is. Moon orbits the Earth, Earth orbits the Sun, uh, stars orbit the center of galaxies, and even galaxies orbit a common center of mass. But there's a speed limit to it that depends on several factors. If the orbiting object is moving too fast, it will escape the gravitational pull that was keeping it in orbit and fly off. This is pretty intuitive if you think about it. Imagine I was rotating a ball on a chain like this. The faster the ball is moving, the stronger my grip needs to be to keep it rotating. Otherwise, if the ball is moving too fast, my strength will no longer be enough, and it will fly off and hit one of you in the head. <laughs> now, astronomers, when they look at the galaxy, for example, they see something very weird. The stars closer to the edge of the galaxy are moving way too fast. They are moving so fast, actually, that they should not be orbiting anymore, but they should be flying off into intergalactic space. But they aren't. Gravity keeps them in orbit. But whose gravity? That's the mystery. Because we look at the visible stuff in the galaxy, we calculate their mass, we add it all up, and we get eight times less gravity than we should. Eight times less. Where is the rest coming from? <laughs> there must be something else hidden in there around which those stars are orbiting so fast that has eight times more mass than the entire visible galaxy. And that something is what we call dark matter these mysterious sources of huge amounts of gravity. And this makes up for 85% of the mass of the universe. No wizards, no dragons, but still absolutely fascinating. And I can't wait for the day when we solve this mystery completely. Thank you. I love your, your little spinning thing analogy. That's Thank actually you. a perfect way to tie that in with colliding galaxies. Um, I would like to uh, hear from you why we can't see the dark matter. I mean, what is it about it? I mean, we can see other things because of the, the interactions that they have, but I would like to see what, you know, explain to people why we haven't been able to find it yet. Okay. We, light is an elect electromagnetic radiation, and uh, we only see uh, things that interact with electromagnetic radiation. So this thing called dark matter has mass but does not interact with electromagnetic radiation, so we cannot see it in any way. We, we see the effect it has, but we cannot detect it. How might you build an instrument that is not based upon the electromagnetic spectrum to image <laughs> such things? <laughs> to detect, I, 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 give us the answer. To detect no, dark great. matter? I'm enjoying this, I'm learning. Come on. <laughs> to detect dark matter? Yes. Well, there are some experiments already. Um, one of them is they use a, a plate, uh, plate of germanium and a lot of detectors. And uh, s uh, they, hope for the, they hope against hope, actually, uh, <laughs> for a particle of dark matter called a WIMP, by the way, weakly interacting massive particle. <laughs> They hope for uh, such a particle to hit the nuclei of germanium, and uh, then alarms go off and people celebrate. But uh, <laughs> nothing, absolutely nothing, has been detected so far. Just, uh, just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> not Making knowing dark is part of the fun for, yeah. for scientists. Yeah. That's the yeah. Making <laughs> dark Thanks. matters matter, our Romanian champ, Bogdan Girogiu. <laughs> and just as a point of trivia, he mentioned weakly interactive massive particles, WIMPs. There are others which are machos. I can't remember what macho stands for. Massively compact. Um, he loves 
you know, Massively complex like halos with some extra halo letters. Halo objects, nachos. Yeah, yeah some of that. So just so you know, there are wimps and machos. There is balance in all things. So we come to our final semi-finalist. Well, our final one for now. There will be another dozen dollops of fame labulousness tomorrow to decide who accompanies the surviving five into Thursday's grand final. That selection process will begin just as soon as we've seen our champion from Cyprus, Christo Dulos Sant Jackie, a teacher in the village of Frenaros near Larnaca. Now, the only thing I know about Frenaros is they have a watermelon festival. And pretty much the only thing I know about Christo Dulos is he's a member of both a theatrical team at Cyprus University and a teacher's dancing group, and that he teaches, quote, mostly the subjects of science, maths, and design and technology to big classes. Not sure how big those big classes are. I'm betting probably not quite as big as the one he's about to face now. Stand by for something that's a lesson, and then some from Christo Dulos Sant Jackie. Have you ever seen a frozen lake? Have you ever wondered how little fish survive in such lakes? Frozen lakes are unique in a way. Firstly, they are made of what? There are no lakes of other liquids, such as wine, oil, or vodka, to freeze. <laughs> Secondly, only water has the property to freeze in such an extraordinary way. This extraordinary way in which water freezes is anomalous. So, this unique property of water is called anomalous expansion. <laughs> this anomaly of water happens just before water freezes. And to be more specific, as water temperature falls down to four degrees, water, as all the other materials, contracts. But from four degrees and until zero degrees, the temperature in which water becomes ice, instead of contracting like all the other materials, water expands. As a result of this expansion, ice becomes lighter than water, and it floats on its surface, just like ice cubes float in our drink. And from the lake and the ice cubes, let's go to your home. Have you ever forgotten soft drink cans in your freezer? <laughs> but what am I asking? Of course you do. <laughs> Everybody does. And when it's time to drink them, <whistles> whoops, the cans are like this, burst. For this mess, blame the anomalous expansion of water because the increased volume of the frozen water included in the soft drink does not feed into the can anymore and can eventually burst. Your freezer might be a total mess, but keep in mind, this phenomenon saves lives. Aquatic organisms living in freezing areas of our planet are thankful to the anomalous expansion of water because their homes are saved. Due to this anomaly, lakes and seas do not freeze apart from the surface. Under the ice, little fish live without freezing to death. So, the next time you feel upset with the anomalous expansion of what that caused a mess in your freezer with bursts of drinks, have in mind, innocent little fish are having <laughs> Parties! <laughs> Celebrating this life-saving anomaly. I love cold fish. Um, <laughs> because some of them are so bonkers, they have adaptations, which means if the sea's warm, they're going to have real problems, which brings into other adaptations that fish possess. There's the ice fish. Um, can you tell us maybe a little bit more about what other adaptations fish might have to deal with cooling waters? Because there is still a thermocline that exists in, in frozen ponds from winter through to summer. So what other adaptations might you see in, in fish to deal with this? And other beasties, like turtles, they do it really well. Uh, what do you mean other adaptations? It's, for instance, uh, cardiac surgeons are really interested in looking at turtles at the moment because they can, they can effectively go to sleep underneath the ice for several weeks and wake up, and, uh, which would kill most vertebrates. And that's an air-breathing animal as well. So what adaptations, when I say 
uh, characters and their morphology and their chemistry that makes them help deal with these super cooled waters, um, which they might not have to deal with in, in, a, in a summer, say. Uh, I don't know if, if fish have something adaptation, that the, but the water has the, the temperature that fish can survive under the ice. Mm -hmm. The water under the ice is four degrees. And I don't think that uh, fish need something to survive in this temperature. Okay, thank you. That was great. I, I know that you're um, a teacher, and so obviously you must make a, a lot of effort with your know, science and maths lessons to make them re really engaging. What do you think is the biggest challenge with young people at the moment in helping them to understand the opportunities which are out there in a world which is sort of fast moving but contains fabulous opportunities for young people? they're getting the right skills, what sort of things are you encouraging your students to think about? Uh, I'm trying to teach them and make them understand that they have to be critical. And whatever they, they learn, to be critical and understand and uh, choose the, the correct uh, knowledge to choose. Because they have a lot of uh, information from the internet now. Everybody have uh, has access to internet, but they have to be critical and choose the correct ones. Yeah, he's clearly all ready to party. Christodoulos Sanjaki. <laughs> and Christodoulos Sanjaki uh, name also con conceals the not very advisable advice, kick lose, it isn't hazardous. Now he was great, he was amazing, and Christodoulos even rhymes with fame labulous. But was he famelabulous, absolutely famelabulous enough to make it to the final? Same goes for Alexi and Bogdan and Jennifer and Lyle and Marcos and Marta and Matias and Raven and Ricardo and Wungbei in strictly alphabetical order. Each has a 45.454545, well, you get the idea, percent chance of making the final. But of course, it's not down to chance, it's down to our judges. So please, can you send Jennifer, Phil, and Maggie on their way with some noise? It's your last chance to yell the names of country or people or subject matter at them. But get out, judges, and get judging. And we need you back here. It's an impossible task, and you've got about 12 minutes to do it in. So on their way, judges, please. Now, our, oh, now, just in the very nick of time, I was just thinking I might have had to fill there for a second, but fortunately, you will see that the cerebral Cerberus that is our three-headed judging panel has loped back into the room, so they may not look decisive, but they wouldn't be if they hadn't reached a verdict. So welcome them back onto the stage, led by Maggie Philbin, our chair. <laughs> Thank you for just about getting there in the nick of time. So, uh, Maggie, it falls to you to spread joy and disappointment in not quite equal measure. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know those fish we were hearing about swimming under the ice? We've been taking them to similar conditions, but we survived <laughs> round the back of the auditorium. <laughs> it was absolutely freezing. And there was quite a lot of discussion. Um, there, were, there were some candidates we all agreed on, and then there were others where, where, where we all fought a corner for, you know, for people. It wasn't, it wasn't straightforward at all. Uh, so this is not a unanimous, exact, exactly decision. It's a sort of collective between you compromise. I think the thing was that there was a lot to like, wasn't there? There is. This, and you can put a piece of paper between all of you. You buggers, you're all too good. <laughs> and then it's really tough to judge it when you can all deliver, you all can tell a great story, and you clearly knew your subjects. And you know that, that is a great pleasure to listen to, so thank you. I mean, it really is hard for us to judge. So it's all going to get a bit random now, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that storytelling really is important, because if you can't draw someone in, if you can't make someone care about what you're going to say, you, you've lost people immediately. Yeah. But decisions had to be made, and I, and I think now is the time, isn't it? You want, I think it's the time. You, yes, OK. Can I just so, stress that there will be five names, but there is no order here? And, and can I ask for a massive... Massive round of applause after each name is read out. And let's get you up on stage, whoever you may be. Yep. When you so in no particular um, order at all, Ricardo Murray Ortega. <laughs> Mar 
Marco Farigo. <laughs> Jennifer Fowley. <laughs> Lyle Tomlinson. <laughs> and Bogdan Georgiou. Oh. That was what your admission fee paid for. Everybody else is doing this for nothing as well. <laughs> so there are no plaques, no prizes. That's still to play for in Thursday's final, but you've got to be in it to win it. And now they are. So they've done brilliantly. And what they'll also be doing, I should tell you, for the first time, new rule for 2014, they will each be giving a completely different presentation in Thursday's final as well. No recycling. But, hey, they're science communicators. They can do another three minutes easy, can't they? <laughs> so... Thank you to Maggie Philbin and our other judges, Jennifer Ouellette and Phil Manning. Thanks also to everyone behind or occasionally in front of the scenes, uh, Juca and the rest of the FameLab team, to yourselves for coming along. Congratulations to the five who made the final. Commiserations to the six who didn't. We are halfway to knowing our final lineup. There are only two ways to find out who the other half will be. One is to wait until Thursday and see who else takes part. But the other much more fun one is to be back here tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. for the second FameLab International semi-final. Hope to see you there. But for now, as the smoke makes us un uh, impossible to breathe, congratulations again to <laughs> Ricardo, Marco, Jennifer, Lyle and Bogdan, our five finalists so far from our 11 FameLabulous FameLabbers. <laughs>